Hi, and welcome to the Diamond Report from Monday, August 31st, 2020. This is your host, Doug Diamond. It's good to be back with you. It's been almost 11 months since my last Diamond Report back in early October of 2019. I think it's safe to say that the world has shifted dramatically since my last broadcast. I continue to be comforted by the fact that God is in control here. And even though what I'm presenting on the Revelation timeline, I believe to be 100% true and as accurate as I can be. And I would just point you all, everybody watching this series, to God and to Jesus Christ first and foremost. With all the information that I bring forth in this series, because it's very disturbing. And just know that he's not surprised by any of it. And even though we don't really know the details of what's coming, at least I feel like he's given us a framework in the book of Revelation, and it's up to us to interpret that so that we have some idea as to when things will happen so that we can be prepared. Now, after completing part four in early October last year, I did an interview with Anthony Patch in November. And in that interview, I stated I felt like at the time, through prayer, that March of 2020 would be the start of something really terrible. I didn't really know specifically what it was, but that I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me March. March. And so that was what I was paying attention to, and that is what I related to Anthony at the time. That interview is in the playlist for this series, and it's clear that I stated it would would happen in March. Now, I've done a couple of other interviews, too, with Celeste Solom and Dave Hodges, where I've stated that I felt like I, I was getting the information, but I wasn't really asking for enough specifics. Therefore, I was getting March, I was getting 2020 as important dates and times, uh, important seasons, if you will. But I wasn't getting details, and perhaps God was hiding those details. He was keeping them secret until the appointed time. I'm beginning to think that what is happening with COVID and the masks and the coming vaccine, which will in turn become the mark of the beast, I'm beginning to think at this point that this is the beginning of the great deception. And many of you know, if you've been listening to me at all or heard any of the interviews that I've done, I've been fairly emphatic that 2021 will be the revealing of the Antichrist. And in September of 2021, I believe, will be his peace plan that he presents to the world. Which means in order for that to happen, certain other things will have to happen first. So between now and September of next year, many people will argue and tell you that the Antichrist is already here and he's Donald Trump or he's Barack Obama or he's fill in the blank. I don't think so. What I am getting from God, and again, take it to the Lord in prayer. What I'm getting from God is that the Antichrist's identity is hidden for right now until the appointed time. And when he comes onto the scene, us as Christians, most of us will be fooled, but some of us will recognize him. And I would go so far as to say even more of us will recognize the Antichrist when he comes on the scene if we know when to look for him. Because that's part of what I'm getting in prayer, is that it's not really important who he is yet. It's more important to know when he comes on the scene, because the person who presents the peace plan in September of next year will be the Antichrist. That's what I'm getting from my prayer time. Now, we're actually going to go more into details about the Antichrist in, fittingly enough, part six of my series, and in this episode, we're going to cover more about the election coming up in November between Donald J. Trump and Joe Biden. But even more importantly, we're going to cover Hillary Clinton and Babylon working, because I think that is even more important than whoever happens to be the placeholder in the Democrat Party. Because officially, Joe Biden is the nominee for the Democrat Party, with Kamala Harris as the VP, and Hillary Clinton is nowhere to be found on the ticket yet. And that could stay that way. I'm not really saying that Hillary Clinton will be on the ticket. She may not be, but we may still end up with her. 
So stick with me on this scenario and let's see what you think. A number of people are sending me videos on Facebook and um, just by email and stuff where they are saying people are putting out these reports that Nancy Pelosi could be the one who comes in because of a contested election that uh, no matter who is actually elected in November, whether it's Trump or Biden, it doesn't really matter because the other side is going to contest the election, which throws the whole thing sort of into, into election purgatory. And then the third in charge, Nancy Pelosi, becomes acting president. Well, I'm not really going to argue that point. I think that's a very valid point. It could very well happen. And it, if she becomes the president, somehow she could bring in Hillary as her VP candidate. Or if good old Joe gets in there somehow, he may instantly be declared incompetent, which of course he is. There's no question. If you've ever heard the guy talk, he can barely form a complete sentence. Kamala Harris could end up as president and bring Hillary in as VP. I think there are a lot of different scenarios where Hillary could still end up with some sort of position of power in the next White House. Hillary could end up in the next presidential administration. In fact, Hillary could end up as president in the next presidential administration. So what we're going to do is briefly examine the spiritual side of why I believe Hillary Clinton will have some position of prominence, whether it's president or some other made-up cabinet position or who knows what, I think that she will absolutely have an important role in the next administration. And I base this on something called Babylon working. And we're going to look at Babylon working in a bit more detail. And in fact, if it wasn't for my knowledge of Babylon working, just finding out about it, through um, author Tom Horn. If I wouldn't have found out about that, I don't know that I would necessarily believe that Hillary would have any kind of role because she's sort of yesterday's news, if you know what I mean. However, when we look at Babylon working, I think if you're thinking that, you may change your mind. And for all of the Trump voters out there, let me just caution you that we are dealing here with spiritual forces. And spiritual forces are more powerful than physical forces. And if you think your guy in November of 2020 is a done deal and there's no way he can lose, you may think differently after hearing what I'm about to read you. And from another one of Hillary's buddies named Joe, meaning Joe Stalin, he said, those who vote decide nothing. Those who count the vote decide everything. So never forget that. And also Mark Twain said, if voting really mattered, they wouldn't let us do it. Now, what is this Babylon working? Let's take a closer look and find out more. For more about the Babylon working, I'm going to read a brief excerpt from Tom Horn's book, Saboteurs. I'm going to pick up on page 143 in the chapter called The Deep Occultism of the Deep State. The Babylon Workings. Now that we've briefed ourselves on the question of metaphysical portals, psychotropic drugs, and occult incantations employed to open them, also verified by scripture, it was into this pot-smoke-filled, heroin-induced, LSD-taking atmosphere of the 40s through the 70s that NASA, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory rocket scientist Jack Parsons and Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard came up with the infamous Babylon working that allegedly opened a gate that fueled the modern UFO era and maybe played a role in the birth of Hillary Clinton. I say this with a strong emphasis on maybe. Both Parsons and Hubbard were disciples of Aleister Crowley and practiced his teaching called Thelema as a philosophy defined by the maxim, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It comes from Crowley's Book of the Law, which can be connected to the spirit cooking ceremonies of the Podestas and Abramovic, which was channeled by an incorporeal demonic intelligence named Iwas, A-I-W-A-S-S. -S. Skipping ahead to page 145, Parsons and Hubbard's motive was largely self-gratification, but the working explicitly stated the goal of transforming traditional values. The rituals were aimed at incarnating the archetypal divine feminine and changing culture through her influence. It is a matter of record that feminism and pantheistic monism 
were sowed into public consciousness from the ivory towers of academia shortly subsequent to Parsons' dark invocation. The ultimate goal of these operations carried out during February and March 1946 was to give birth to the magical being or, quote, moon child, described in Crowley's works. Using the powerful energy of Roman numeral 9, degree sex magic, M-A-G-I-C-K, the rites were intended to open a doorway through which the goddess Babylon herself might appear in human form. Parsons believed that he and Hubbard accomplished this task in a series of rituals culminating in 1946. Parsons' biography preserves a celebratory statement regarding her embodiment in the womb. In a fragment from his writings, Parsons, exhausted and exultant, declared his work a success. He believed that Babylon, in the manner of immaculate conception, was due to be born to a woman somewhere on earth in nine months' time. Babylon is incarnate upon the earth today, awaiting the proper hour for her manifestation, he wrote. Let me read that one more time. Babylon is incarnate upon the earth today, awaiting the proper hour for her manifestation. Accordingly, one would expect a female child was to be born around 1947, and indeed, such an influential feminist was delivered that year, who may offer the most promise for identifying the fruit of Parsons' infamous ritual. That would be none other than Hillary Rodham Clinton. Intriguingly, Parsons later referred again to Babylon the Scarlet Woman, and this time by a particular name in his Book of the Antichrist. Again, Parsons' book is called Book of the Antichrist. On October 31st, Halloween, 1948, a full 69 years ago, when the female child would have been only around one year of age, Parsons wrote that her spirit contacted him, calling itself Hilarion, who he said would become an international public figure dedicated to bringing the work of the Antichrist to fruition. Why is that important? because the etymology of Hilarion is the arcane Hillary. I asked myself how many internationally influential feminists were born in 1947 who are named Hillary and that have the potential to become the leader of the most powerful nation on earth, which was dedicated from its inception to the enthronement of Osiris Apollo, who the Bible recognizes as Antichrist, and a spirit calling itself Hillary, Made clear to Jack Parsons 69 years ago, it is dedicated to helping become king of the earth. Can a mathematician please provide me the statistical probability of chance for this? This came to mind when reading the WikiLeaks email revelations and remembering how Hillary hinted, quote, alien disclosure would be made if she was elected president. And Abramovic, the Podestas, and other close Hillary affiliates were manifest believers in the same UFOs and contiguous aliens that Parson and Hubbard sought. The Church of Scientology that Hubbard started is based on an alien called Xenu, X-E-N-U, as well as being practitioners of the same Crowley occultism that Parsons and Hubbard were devotees of, and it immediately seemed to me beyond probability of coincidence. Rather, I straightway thought in the days leading up to the presidential election that these modern Thelemists actually believed Hillary is or could be the incarnation of the archetype divine feminine, the whore of Babylon, the Hilarion, that is set to take the throne of the most powerful nation on earth to assist the Antichrist in his bid to rule the entire world. But, you may say, Hillary lost the election. And that is the end of that, right? Um, not so fast. When America's next presidential election takes place in 2020, Hillary will be 72 years old as we enter that year. And the number 72, as all occultists and assuredly Abramovic and the Podestas know, is the highest number in Satanism and archaic sorcery. It is the number of lead devils, according to the Lesser Key of Solomon, the number of evil disciples and accomplices of Set that enclosed the god 
Osiris, Apollo to the Greeks, and the spirit that possesses Antichrist in the book of Revelation. In a coffin, the number of Goetic demons, and also the age when Aleister Crowley died. 72. And I would also point out that 72 is 66 plus 6. Hillary Clinton, in my opinion, is Hilarion. Or maybe I should say the spirit of Hilarion is inhabiting the body of the person that we know as Hillary Rodham Clinton. And looking at the Wikipedia page of the Whore of Babylon, also known as Hilarion, scroll down just a little ways here, born October 26, 1947, age 72, right now, folks. So she'll be 72 until October 26th. If she's elected in November, she will be 73. But the point is, up to that point, she will be 72, which is 66 plus 6. And to further drive the point home, Hillary Diane Rodham is 18 letters, which is 6 plus 6 plus 6. And Hillary Rodham Clinton is 20 letters, and this is the year 2020. And just a little further evidence here, when you look up Hillary with one L, you get Hilarion. You click on Hilarion. Hilarion is a male form of a Latin-derived name related to the name Hillary, in which modern times is mainly feminine. And here's a video of Tom Horn talking about essentially everything I just read from his book. I will put the link to this video in the description box below. This article on rightwingwatch.org is about um, that video, essentially. Is Hillary Clinton the whore of Babylon? And it's just a, a short few paragraphs, little synopsis of what I just read. Definitely also look up uh, Babylon working. In, in, there's different spellings of it. In Tom's book, it's spelled just like this. Um, but it's also sometimes spelled with a Y, so you could look it up either way. But it talks about uh, L. Ron Hubbard, Jack Parsons, Aliester Crowley. Lots of links and things here that you can jump off to and read more about it if you want to, including the uh, Book of the Antichrist by Jack Parsons and so forth. <laughs> and I would also point out that if you look on here at all for the word Hilarion or Hillary Clinton, you will not find it because it's not on there. You can look up uh, L. Ron Hubbard, too. Here's a picture of him. I used to live in um, Los Angeles for a few years as I was in the music business, and still am, and uh, they would run ads on TV for L. Ron Hubbard's book, Dianetics, and they would call it The Owner's Manual to the Human Mind. I always thought that was funny. Probably sucked a lot of people in, I guess. And surprisingly, there's quite a bit of information on the Jack Parsons page here about Babylon working and um, Aliester Crowley and so forth. There's Crowley, JPL, L. Ron Hubbard, and the Babylon working. So feel free to look that one up too. So you can see there appear to be quite a few connections between Hilarion the Spirit, Hillary Rodham Clinton, and Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard doing their conjuring and magical witchcraft about a year or two before she was born into a human body. In 1947, which is a key year, 1947 will come up again in episode 6 when we talk about the Antichrist. Now let's take a look at the Revelation 12 sign prophecy that did happen on September 23rd, 2017. There are those out there in YouTube land and in other places who are interpreting the book of Revelation, and I think in most cases doing a pretty good job. However, one of the mistakes that I'm noticing is that they start the final seven years on their timeline. They start it with this Revelation 12 sign in September of 2017, and therefore it throws everything else off in the timeline. If you look at it, then three and a half years from September of 17 would be March of 2021 as the midpoint, essentially, in the Revelation timeline. 
and then Jesus returning in, say, 2024, which would be another three and a half years later, in September of 2024. I believe this is wrong. And what I'm going to show you here is that I think the Revelation 12 prophecy was actually foreseeing, letting us know that it was going to be the Antichrist who comes on the scene in three and a half years. And if you look at three and a half years after September of 2017, you're looking at March of 2021. And again, in November last year, I stated in an interview that I felt like March was really important. And I was given that in prayer, March. But maybe March didn't only mean 2020. Maybe March also meant 2021. Maybe it's both. So March of 2020 starts the downward spiral uh, with COVID-19 and the lockdowns and the face masks and you name it where we are right now to March of 2021, which could be the revealing of the actual Antichrist. But we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the next episode. Now, just as a little reminder on what the Revelation 12 sign prophecy was, if we look on Wikipedia, the passage in the book of Revelation 12, 1 through 3, describes a woman clothed with sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Let's take a look at that graphic. Now, this is an actual animation. It's showing the crown of 12 stars, which are nine stars that make up Leo plus the three planets, which are Mercury, Mars, and Venus, all in alignment. And then the woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet, as you can see there, pregnant with child, which of course is Jupiter, 42 weeks. So for a little bit more background on that, let's take a look at this video clip that I found, which I thought was extraordinary and had some really good interpretations and explanations. So there are signs and seasons and there are Jewish feasts that happen and Jesus fulfilled Passover. Jesus has, uh, you know, fulfilled many of these feasts. However, there are feasts in the future that aren't fulfilled yet. One of them is the Feast of Trumpets, which happens to be today, church. It's actually right now today. And it starts, uh, you know, the 23rd of September, the evening and the morning. And so we're actually in the middle of the Feast of Trumpets uh, that happens every year. It happens on a different day every year. However, before the Feast of Trumpets, uh, there is a start of a 40-day period of repentance that Israel would always observe, and it always started on the first of Elul, the month of Elul. And so guess what happened in America on the first of Elul this year? We had an eclipse. We had a solar eclipse that passed across our entire nation on August the 21st. The total eclipse is going to be amazing. It's going to be the first time in decades that we've had a total eclipse that's visible over most of the continental United States. On August 21st of 2017, a total solar eclipse that just so happens to occur on the first of a lull, the very beginning of the month of repentance that is leading up to the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. This has to be more than coincidence. The sun, as far as a total solar eclipse, refers to judgment coming upon the nations. When was the last time we had a total solar eclipse that completely crossed the United States? Did you know it was at the end of World War I? And here we have America involved in World War I. Many people don't realize World War I also began with a total solar eclipse that went all through Eastern Europe, through Turkey, and even went all the way through Nineveh. And what do we see happened? The Ottoman Empire is destroyed and the solar eclipse went right through the Ottoman Empire. So we see a pattern of judgment. So the last time the United States had a complete solar eclipse, we were actually involved in a world, world war, World War I. 
And during that time, as he said, the solar eclipse actually went all the way across the Middle East where the Ottoman Turk Empire was. It held Jerusalem and held that land, and they were destroyed. Ottoman Turk Empire was actually destroyed at that time. Now, just because of the design of the solar system, we get eclipses. And so eclipses are not a rare thing. But where an eclipse is a big deal is when it falls on a feast day. That's when it's a prophetic event. That's when you got to pay attention. And this year, the solar eclipse fell right on the first of Elul, which is the day that marks the beginning of repentance for the nation of Israel. And um, it's interesting in studying this that in 2014 and 2015, there were actually the four blood moons. All four of these blood moons fell on feast days of Israel. All of them did. And again, that's not a coincidence. And so you see these blood moons falling on um, these feast days. You see this uh, total solar eclipse that's crossing our nation on the day of repentance. Uh, we ought to get a clue and wake up, right, church? Our nation needs to get a clue and wake up. And so um, looking at this, you know, what happened in our nation during 2014 and 2015? You know, as we start looking at these things, there were some really terrible things that happened in our nation. We actually passed gay marriage in our, our nation. And on the day we passed gay marriage, we took God's symbol of the rainbow, his very symbol of covenant, and put it on the White House in defiance of his very word. There's not much more you could do to be more de defiant and rebellious to God as a nation than that. Amen? Can you think of anything? I can't think of much. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing these blood moons. We're seeing this eclipse. You know, it's a wake-up call. And it's interesting. The, did you know that the very first blood moon that came in our nation in 2014 to today, guess how many days it's been? 1,260 days. You might recognize that number because it's in the book of Revelation many times. Um, that it's been 1,260 days since that first blood moon happened in 2014 to today. When, so it's amazing when you start looking at all these events that are happening and what's, what's happening, kind of where we're at. Um, think about this. Have, you know, unless you've been living in a cave and only in certain parts of the nation, you know since the first of Elul, our nation has gone through unbelievable things. Now, what's going on today? You know, we've, we've been through this time. Ever since the first of Elul, there hasn't been a day on our calendar that something hasn't happened. It's been pretty serious, hasn't it? What is this all leading up to? Well, today, as I said, is uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. I think one of the things that's happening with the great American eclipse is that there's something following it. On September 23rd of 2017, there is an alignment that is happening in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the constellations, which looks like something that John wrote about in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. In the first two verses, he's talking about the sun, the moon, the stars, the wandering stars, which we call planets, and a constellation, which is Virgo. John says that he sees a great sign in heaven, that there is a woman, she is clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet, and she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. But she's also pregnant, but not just pregnant, she's in labor and about to give birth. We know that Virgo would be the woman. The moon will actually be at her feet, uh, the sun will traverse by back her shoulder, clothing her in the sun. And in her head will be 12 stars. Nine of those will be the constellation of Leo. It makes up Leo. They're always there. But the three other ones that are not there are the syzygy, the alignment of planets. Mercury will align. We'll have Venus that's there and also Mars, making up the 12 stars. And we can see that the 12 constellations around the ecliptic only has one woman in it that the sun, the moon, and the wandering stars can travel through and that would be Virgo. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant. Now how can a sign in heaven be pregnant?
there's another planet that is right now being in what we would call the womb of Virgo for several months, and it will exit that womb due to what's called retrograde motion, which is going back and forth on September 23rd. What happened in November of 2016, the planet Jupiter moves into the birthing canal in the constellation of this woman, and it stays there for a period of close to 42 weeks, which is a human gestation period. And it doesn't exit until the sign is finished on September 23rd, 2017. When we see this occurrence of Jupiter going into the womb of, of Virgo, that does happen every 11 years. It's not rare. We know the moon's at her feet once a year, so that's not rare. Uh, what we do see as very rare are these three planets lining up in Leo. As they come in again, this makes this occurrence once every 7,000 years. That is extremely rare. I actually took the time I went back 6,000 years and I took screenshots of every single time that the woman was clothed in the sun with the moon at her feet. Because again, that happens every year. But do you have her giving birth? And do you have 12 stars at her head? There's never been a day that the exact same thing that happens in 2017 has ever happened. I also went 1,000 years into the future. It's just not there. This is the year that it seems that John saw right down the line every single thing that's going to happen on September 23rd factually is mentioned in a book that's 2,000 years old. So today there is a prophetic film fulfillment of what the Apostle John saw 2,000 years ago. Today. It's a once in a multi-millennial fulfillment and we're talking this doesn't happen ever. It's, it's never happened. It's not ever scheduled to happen again that we even know of. Uh, it, it would be so far off. So Revelation 12, 1, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So we have the constellation Virgo, and we have the constellation Leo. Virgo is the only woman that all the planets travel through to even fulfill this prophecy. And then above uh, the constellation Virgo is the constellation Leo that has nine stars. So normally, uh, once a year, the sun will appear like on the shoulder of Virgo and the moon will be under her feet. That, that happens every year. Once a year, it happens. Um, once every 11 years, Jupiter will even enter the womb of Virgo. And it's so amazing when you watch this video, what you're gonna see is that J Jupiter comes in to the womb of Virgo and then starts jogging back and forth while all the other planets are spinning around and going by, Jupiter just literally stops in the womb of Virgo and stays there nine months. Jupiter is called the king planet. Represents King Jesus, amen? The king planet. And so uh, Jupiter is in the womb of Virgo for nine months. Now what fulfills this prophecy that's never happened before is Mercury, Venus, and Mars line up, and I actually saw this last night about midnight, and I posted on it on Facebook, I took a picture of it on my phone, is Mercury, Venus, and Mars lined up uh, with Leo, the nine stars of Leo, to count 12 stars, a 12-star crown above Virgo with Jupiter in the womb, coming out of the womb today, Jupiter's being birthed today, the king planet birthed today, while we have Marie, Mar Mary and Joseph in the Caribbean right over here. There's also a comet coming into play that crosses all this today. And then there's uh, the, you know, the moon at the feet. It's just absolutely astonishing. And as they looked at this, this has never happened in human history. Like, it's never happened. And they looked in the future. It's not going to happen again. And it is exactly and precisely what the Apostle John says, saw. You're sitting here on a day when Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. And a time clock of the return of Jesus is ticking for sure. Amen? The return of Jesus. Because Rosh Hashanah... Now, Rosh Hashanah... Let me go, let me go with this a little bit farther. On Rosh Hashanah the day would start with a blow of the shofar. There's four blasts that happen. The first blast is in the morning 
And the blast is to wake you up. And it had a certain sound. You can actually go on the internet with Perry Stone and Bill Cloud and they teach on this. It's amazing. The second blast of the shofar, it is a sound that almost sounds like weeping. And what it's saying is, wake up, church. Repent, church. The next sound is a sound to be alert, to be watchful. How many of you know the Bible talks about watch and pray? Pray that you're accounted worthy to escape all the things which shall come on the earth. Amen. You read that in the Gospels, right? Watch and pray. The final blast is the last trump. The last trump is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, when uh, Paul talks about the return of the Lord. The Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the trump of God. And that's the last trump is the return of the Lord. Amen? And so Jesus could come back today, but I'm not setting a date than saying he's going to. You know, the, the expression, no man knows the day or the hour, the expression, no man knows the day of the hour, is a Jewish idiom. What that actually comes from is the fact that um, in, it, when this, this feast starts, they would have two watchers that would watch the heavens, and when the first appearance of the very slit of the moon, after the moon had ended and the new moon appears, it appears with just a little tiny sliver, they would have two watchmen, and they would blow a trumpet that the Rosh Hashanah had started. And everybody that heard the trumpet, uh, it would be at night, obviously, because, you'd right, it's at night when the moon comes out and you see the, the sliver. They would blow the trumpet, but they could never calculate ahead of time exactly when the new moon would be and when it would start. They had to wait to see it. So they had these watchers that would wait to see the new moon appear and they would blow the trumpet. And if you were not in the, the city walls, you had to have oil in your lamp. You had to be a wise virgin and you had to be listening and watching so you could light your lamp and make your way through the dark and make it into the city gate because very quickly they would shut the gate and those that weren't inside didn't get to partake of the feast and weren't part of the feast. They went through a certain gate. And so the expression, no man knows the day or the hour because they couldn't project the day when Rosh Hashanah would happen. It had to come when the two witnesses would blow the trumpet and announce it's, it's coming to pass. Okay. And so most Bible scholars, I would say, maybe not all of them, but many, many Bible scholars actually believe Jesus will return on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, that it's a, he would fulfill that prophetic type. Now he could return on the Feast of Trumpets or he could return on another day. Um, it could, you know, it could happen either way, but there's a lot of Bible scholars that actually believe he will return on the Feast of Trumpets. Jesus was crucified on Passover. When he fulfilled Passover, he wasn't crucified the day after, the day before. He was crucified on Passover, wasn't he? And so, you know, with some of these Jewish idioms and these expressions we see in Scripture, it would be like if you could go a thousand years in the future and our civilization didn't exist and somebody reads something that says Facebook. You wouldn't know what Facebook was. You'd be like, Facebook, what, the, the, the book face, or, you know, what does this mean? But if you live in 2017, everybody knows what Facebook is, right? I mean, almost everybody. And so there's some things that are expressions based on the time in which you live. And if you don't know that, and you just read them as a 20th century American, you're not going to get what it says, right? And so that's why it's fun to study the Bible, isn't it? Now, after watching that video, it kind of got my curiosity peaked. I was interested to find out what was Hillary Clinton doing or saying on September 23rd, 2017, if anything. And I came across a few interesting articles I thought I would just bring to your attention. Now, I'm not saying Hillary Clinton is the Antichrist, but as they say in Babylon Working, I think that her job was to help usher in the Antichrist. And look at the dates of these articles that I'm going to show you. September 23rd, 2017, Hillary Clinton. Women who support Trump are publicly disrespecting themselves. That's one example. This is from the Anchorage Daily News. Hillary Clinton rides a carousel of excuses. Look at the date. Published September 23rd, 2017. Again, right on the date of the Revelation 12 sign. From the Irish Times, Clinton's what happened book does not tell what really happened there she is and this was published september 23rd 2017 and one more is hillary clinton really to blame for trump this is from nbc news 
Take note of the date of this video. I'm not going to play the video, but it was September 23rd, 2017. Pretty interesting, all these connections between Hillary Clinton and the Book of Revelation, Chapter 12, sign. Now let's take a look at one more thing today before we wrap it up. Most of you are familiar with the Deagle Report. You can find it on deagle.com, but it's D-E-A-G-E-L.com. Some people misspell it and they can't find it. United States of America, 2017, population 327 million. I think most of you are familiar with what I'm about to show you, but uh, when you compare it to the timeline that I have, it's pretty shocking. The population forecast for United States of America, 2025, 100 million. So let that sink in. What happens to 227 million people? Where do they go? Do they die? Is Hillary Clinton helping to usher in the Antichrist, who, by 2025, according to my timeline, will be in full power? And what happens here? Just food for thought. I noticed this uh, a couple months ago, that the Deagle Report coincides and fits right into the Revelation timeline as I present it. Scary stuff. But God is in control. And he's using Satan and the Antichrist to play out his vision for the world's future. And then taking a look at my timeline, and I would just point out that I haven't changed anything on this timeline um, in quite some time, and certainly not since part four that I recorded 11 months ago. So if you were to look at my timeline, it looks exactly the same. Nothing's changed. Uh, I will certainly let you know if something gets updated. But so far, nothing has changed since I started this project last year. But have a look at 2025 here. The Antichrist reign begins starting the final three and a half years in January of 2025. If you look at the, and I covered this in episode two of my series, the four Euphrates-based demons lead a 200 million strong army to kill one third of humanity. And now I'm convinced after COVID and everything that happened in China that the 200 million strong army is indeed the Chinese military. And I brought that to your attention in part two of my series as well. So if that's the case, then apparently they're successful here, killing a third of humanity, which could explain what the Deagle Report is talking about with such a sharp decline in the population of the United States, and then if you look at the rest of the report, around the world, 2025. So that's really all I had for you today. Um, stay tuned for part six, which will be coming out in the next few days. And I've had a few people ask me where they can get a copy of this timeline as I present it. And what I'll do is put a link to the timeline. To, it's a JPEG. I'll put a link to it in the description box if you'd like to download it and check it out yourself. No problem. And I will see you next time on the Diamond Report. Thanks for listening and watching.